It's my pleasure now to introduce a segment that really came about through an extraordinary meeting I had about a year and a half ago. I'd gone to visit the leading independent architectural practice JT and partners to discuss what I thought I was going there to discuss, a magazine article. And I met the company's founder and managing director for the first time. And we got into a conversation purely by chance about the Spanish uh, nouveau, nouveau realist architect, Ricardo Bofill, who we both like very much. This conversation locked us into a dialogue that lasted nearly two hours. And I suddenly had an idea. I thought, what if we transition that dialogue from the safety, in inverted commas, of this man's office onto a stage? What would be the conclusions that we could reach in an open dialogue? And how would a valued audience want to interact with that discussion? Well, let's find out. Let's find out. It's a huge pleasure to welcome to the stage Joe Tabet. Joe, really great to see you here today. Thank you, Paul. Lovely to see you, Joe. Pleasure. So, Joe, please. Joe, tell us, what's the future of architecture? What's it all about? What's your vision of the future? Are we going to keep talking about the same subject? Well, it's up to you, Joe. Let's, let's visit it. Let's dip into it. What do you no, think about it? we were planning future? something to do together, but... Uh... <sighs> I believe that um, there's a lot of people better than me that they can talk about the architecture and how it's moving. But uh, we thought today it would be better to take it to a totally different level. And let's discuss the metaverse and the architecture in the metaverse and of the metaverse. And that's why uh, when we had the discussion, Paul and myself, I told him, do I know much about Metaverse? I'll tell you, be honest, no. I know nothing, nobody knows. Whoever will tell you, Christian, he's there behind. <laughs> and nobody knows about it enough. And it's a trend that we are trying to understand and trying to understand where it's going to take us. And that's how I propose to that let's have a discussion that will mix the architecture and the Metaverse to really... Uh, understand uh, what's going to be next, and especially that it's a pleasure today for me to have all the students with us that we've been fighting for six years, that students, they have to come for such conferences, students, they have to come for uh, the award ceremonies and the competitions, because for us as in the market, as experts, this is how we will be able to highlight the future architects that they're going to lead the metaverse. Absolutely. So, Joe, just to, just to kick things off, you quite rightly talk about the challenge of the metaverse and that despite people claiming a level of expertise, nobody really knows what that, how that space can be best used and developed. So, look, let's look at one of the debates actually going on in the physical real world of architecture and let's ask if that debate can now be transitioned. Is that debate relevant to the metaverse? So here we are. Here's, a, here's a, a thought. I personally feel, and I think you might share this view, Joe, that one of the debates in the physical world of architecture in a moment is that there's a, like a choice of future directions. Right? So are we going to look at a direction which is where buildings are very much integrated with the natural world, with their surroundings? And when I look at the work of JT and partners, for example, I see projects like Mango House, I see Hillside Residence in Rack, I see Tawila Island in the Red Sea Resort. These are all very highly integrated with their surroundings. And yet, on the other hand, there is a school of thought that argues that the future is about maximising the availability of ground space, which means building super tall and creating self-contained vertical cities. So, for instance... As long ago as 1956, and we, we mentioned this, Frank Lloyd Wright 
created a plan for a building that was uh, 5,000 feet high, a mile high, called the Illinois. Now, those dreams for vertical cities, where you'd have hundreds of thousands of people living and working, never leaving, never really needing to leave, that dream has never been fully developed or fulfilled. But that's still an available choice. Do you still see those, do you see those choices as relevant to the metaverse or not? In my opinion, things are going very fast. Faster than what we believe. And you have a supply and demand and you have a technology next to it. So you see that we live in a, uh, in a contradiction in all what we're doing at the moment. With the line project in Saudi Arabia, you're going, very, you're going horizontal, you're not going vertical. So it's not about uh, at the urban level what you're going to be doing because there's going to be always this kind of interaction, emotional approach from the human being to how he's going to react to the space around him. And this is something we keep forgetting and forgetting and forgetting, and that's where it will take you to the metaverse. And isn't that emotional content critical to the metaverse? Uh, It's all about the emotion, and it's all about what do you feel and how we will react. And we have... Mr. Namely from the ACOM now, he's going to be talking at the urban level that it's, it's, it's people, and that's what I keep saying, that the power that we have as architects is when we draw a line, this line, it will define a city. And this line will define how people, they're going to react and live in the city. So when you look at it now, and you start to hit a little bit that uh, we are in a very bumpy situation since the pandemic happened. We're talking about the metaverse, about the cloud, and then we're talking about the public realm, and then people, they're talking about farming. So you're talking about things that they are in the real life, and at the same time, things that they are uh, uh, virtual. So there is a lot of contradiction, and this is where the stress is coming to us. We live a stress. All of us, we want to know what's next. All of us, we want to know... Uh, we're, we're jumping everywhere. And it all started, people, they say the metaverse started with the pandemic. I'll say, no, go back. Go back really old days and we were getting prepared. We, we are driven to things. We don't have choice. So, Joe, like with the, with the metaverse, with, with design and architecture on the metaverse at the moment, the side of this that I hear most about is the design and build of virtual real estate. So people are already buying and selling metaverse packages, as they're called. I don't hear so much about the aesthetics of design. In fact, I know you believe that in, me- that in say, online gaming, for instance, and so on, the actual architectural content is relatively poor. What do you think? It started with the gaming. The gaming that all our kids, they spend hours and hours from the pandemic playing Fortnite, Minecraft, building architecture in the virtual world. And the question will end up to be, who are the future architects of the metaverse? It's not us. The architects of the metaverse, they're going to be the young generation that they are nine years old, and 10 years old. It's not us. Because in the metaverse, you don't have engineering, you don't have gravity, you don't need anything from all this. You can just dream. You can build anything in the metaverse. And you can feel it that now you go and then you buy a plot for 160 million on the metaverse. All right? And it happened. But who bought it? Who's buying in the metaverse? Are the billionaires. And the big investors, it's not us. And that's why they're making it difficult on us because we want to know what's coming there and it's coming. If I believe in it or I don't believe in it, it's coming. The first wedding on the metaverse took place. We all know about it. And it's going to be more gaming platform. It's going to be more concerts. And it took place with Justin Bieber and many others. You have conferences, similar to what we're doing now. You're going to have businesses, testing business operation. It's going to happen on the metaverse and education. 
you don't have to fly to the U.S. to be in Harvard. You can attend Harvard on the Metaverse, which is a Zoom meeting. But the Zoom meeting, you have a screen in front of you. Yeah. And then you see the faces of the people. They are all properly dressed on the higher side and then <laughs> naked on the lower side. In the Metaverse, you have your mini-me or the avatar that they call it. And you can go interact. So we will be in a space that I can look at you, you look, can look at me. It's just the beginning. We are in a very early stage in the metaverse because, for example, fashion. There is Adidas, there is Nike. They jumped on the metaverse. You have Shalhub Group in here, yeah. the retailer, they jumped. You have Gargash, Mercedes, they jumped on the metaverse now. Everybody is jumping. It's just to secure place for the unknown. Just in case it happened, we are there. So are you there? Is, what about JT and partners? Are you, I'm here. Yeah, I know you're here. <laughs> and you're very welcome to be there, Joe. But, uh, but are you, as a practice, now, as it were, for want, of a, for want of a better phrase, are you going to clients and upselling, broadening the, the, the relationship and saying, look, let's now design elements for you on the metaverse are you taking that to existing clients are you developing a metaverse division for your business for instance 99.99 percent of the clients are not ready for the metaverse because they want a return on investment tomorrow yeah and the metaverse is a return on investment which is unforeseen and it's in the future and it's driven by very top people somewhere around the world and it's a continuity of the bitcoin because on the metaverse, you use the Bitcoin and then there is this uh, different uh, cryptocurrencies that it is happening. So we just need, we need to read a little bit. I'm not here to talk politics. <laughs> it's not easy. But uh, uh, the people on the metaverse at the moment, they are the billionaire of this world. That they can afford it and they can afford 1% of their fortunes to be spent on something. So clients now... Even like, we didn't manage to convince clients to go for 3D printing yet. Yes, true, true. Yeah. And then to go and then convince them to go into the metaverse, I believe we have a lot to do. We are not yet there. We're just researching and trying to understand because it's very fast. Who knows about it more than us or our kids? They know a lot about it. My son, he buys land. There is a game on Roblox because Roblox has many games, and it has a uh, California as a real. So they go around and they see the real plots, the real building, everything the real, and they buy, and, 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 and. The question is, the real owner of that plot, what's the situation of that real owner? Absolutely. If I own a plot in Dubai, on the metaverse, anybody else can own it. There is a lot of laws and regulations similar to Bitcoin. Bitcoin, the problem is at the moment that there is this big fight between the real banks and the Bitcoin because they're trying to take over each other. And that's why the, they're saying we need a central bank for Bitcoin. Why they need central bank for Bitcoin? Which defeats the whole object of having cryptocurrency. Because they want to control way. it. They Absolutely. want to know that yeah. you're making transition. They need to give you approval Absolutely. on your transition. At the moment, Bitcoin doesn't need approval. And Metaverse doesn't need approval. Yeah. But, you know, trying to get that, that sort of solid, for want of a better phrase, that solid platform to build on is virtually impossible in the physical world, let alone in the metaverse. Like You gave the incredible example a while ago, Joe, when we met a year or so ago. Of, you know, you just try building a sidewalk across Business Bay. You know, just try getting common ownership for more than 200 metres of any bit of land. It's almost impossible. And that's in the physical world. Just try doing that in the metaverse where everyone could have common ownership, common claim on ownership. How would you get around that claim on ownership in the metaverse? Look, <clears throat> that's why I said we are in a very early stage. If, if, you look, if you look at the fashion in the metaverse where they're saying you will be able to try fit the clothes before you're buying them and then getting this opportunity. It's all leading to digital twin that we discussed about yeah. before. The digital twin is going to help the metaverse to become a reality and is going to work in some businesses. 
if I want to link, to go shop anything at the metaverse, I need my avatar to look similar like me. So I need a digital twin of myself that's going to be linked to a chip in my body yeah. that will test my blood pressure, my overweight, my food intake. So when I test fit any shirt, it will be the real one. Now I don't need an extra large and I will buy a medium. So at that moment when it will happen, where we have our digital twin on the metaverse, which is coming, yeah. because digital twin now, it's working in architecture, urban planning around the world. They test fit the product before building it. They know how it's going to operate. Absolutely. And the metaverse is going to take businesses and see how this business can operate and be profitable. So the question is, what's linked to what? And this is why I'm saying it's very fast. Digital Twin is very fast. Look, we didn't finish 3D printing yet. Absolutely. And then we start with Digital Twin. Yeah. And then Digital Twin, we didn't reach yet to it. And we're talking about the metaverse. So how, this is how fast it is. Or we're going to reach a level like, the problem is when we spoke in previous conferences about you watch movies 15 years ago and then suddenly the fifth element, you see flying cars. I was just going to mention the fifth element. Like, How far do you think we are away from the world of the fifth element where you have independent fly, personal flying vehicles, for instance? Uh, we have some cars are flying in place, yeah. which are going to come because you need more. We, we, need, we, need, we need investors. Yeah. You need the money to try all these things. So when you watch Matrix and the Black Mirror, that this is the metaverse. So my question is, are we going to be in 10 years' time attending the same conference in our beds linked to a cable? But we are in the, in the conference. And that's what's Matrix. They used to be linked to a cable. That's the, 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 the So are they, what is the preparation? Don't, don't be scared, but I'm saying it's like, if you want to take it to a really new level and understand how it's going to go, because now you tell somebody, go invest 160 million and buy a plot in the metaverse, it's like, he will tell you, what you're talking about? Yeah, why would I do that? But, yeah. Paul, plenty of people at the high level, they're doing it. They're doing it. So flying cars is going to come. Things are going to come. You're talking to me about the urban fabric and all these things. We are not ready at, uh, to, to receive flying cars because we are still building uh, master plans. Sorry. <laughs> We're still building master plans at the urban level and buildings with no regulations and guidelines to receive flying cars in the cities. So are you therefore saying, Joe, that the real progress in the future will be in the virtual world of the metaverse, not in the physical world? Do you think the physical world will just stagnate, will just stay as we are? And the real progress will then be the virtual world of the metaverse. What do you think? It depends on the new future generations. They're going to define all this. Because for us, we are a little bit in the, in the middle. We lived the normal life and then we were hit by the technology and now we're trying to understand and struggle and not to be able to sleep. And when you look at your kids, the way they manipulate the iPad and the games and whatever, they are far better than us. So the future is in their hand because uh, uh, with the metaverse, you cannot predict. You can do whatever you want. There is no limitation at all. The wedding that they did, they bought the ring. So they asked uh, the couple, what you did with the ring? They bought money, they paid money for NFT for the ring. They said, we have a picture of it on the iPhone. So our brains, maybe me, it's like, why I need a picture? My son telling me, let's buy a, a NFT for a monkey for $20,000. I told him, we have art at home. We can feel it. We can touch it. We can enjoy it. Convince him. He was not convinced. So does, does, does this, do these thoughts about the future constrain what you're doing here and now in the present? So, for instance, you've, you've recently opened the new mosque in Creek Harbour. It's phenomenal, phenomenal mosque. Yeah? Very, again, very integrated with its surroundings. 
What do you build something of that kind with a life expectancy, given the potential shape of the future, or do you build it for the present? Look, when you design, we use the word timeless. We use the word timeless architecture. For me, it's not the architecture that it has to be timeless, because you don't live on the facade of the building. It's the space that you create. Yeah. The space has to be timeless and has to be functional. And that's why I'm saying is we, our gener each generation is used to a rhythm of life which is different than the previous one. And during the pandemic, we struggled more than our kids being at home because they went and lived into their virtual life. Hmm. We couldn't. I didn't see myself sitting, I don't know how to play, uh, what they call it? I haven't got a clue. You know what I mean. <laughs> so they managed it, we didn't manage. And that's yeah. why there's a lot of, maybe people they were expecting from me to give them a proper answer. We don't have a proper answer because things will be, will be changing based on uh, the reaction of the society. And this goes to the current situation. When we design now, we design based on the data that we have in our hand and the technology that we have in our hand. And this is something very important because at the end of the day, you have an end user and you have a client. Yep. That client is the investor. He's going to come and tell you, don't use my money to explore. And this is the challenge on us as designers to explore without telling him and try to do something different, yeah. and then to push the bar. And this is what we're doing in our project. We try to push it step by step, change the space, change this, change the material. We are still behind. All of us, we're really behind. Because when it comes to materiality, you see all of us running to supplier X and supplier D in Spain and Charger and Russell Heimauer. Nobody is saying that I want to, to have 3D... 3D printing, we asked client once, I, we told him, 3D printing is going into fashion, into jewelry. It's going into public realm on the furniture at the urban level. It's going everywhere. Not much client. It's been, how much we've been talking about 3D printing? Show me how many there is 3D printed houses or buildings or where is the technology? That's there is big. some, yeah. but it's not that it's going to allow us to build a 50-story tower in the future that is going to be uh, pushing the 3D printing technology beyond what it is now. The more you explore, the more you, get, you move on. Yeah. And yet 3D printing, which of course enables on-site modular construction, clearly has many benefits. And it has a huge risk management benefit because you have far less people engaged on site, far less risk of accident, far less capital expenditure because you don't need so much mechanised assembly on site. You're simply welding pre-established seams and so on. There seem to be a lot of benefits. Aesthetically, it doesn't have to be bad. Aesthetically, it can be very pleasing. But as you say, it's not, it's not really catching on to that extent. Why is that? It's like, that's, that's just the beginning of it. That's, it's very simple. It's just the beginning. You know, like when we were doing a research on this 3D printing, there is a university in Germany that they're studying the use of coffee and the material and mixing the coffee with grass and stuff like that. So we are still exploring. And the best part so far is using the desert sand desert sand, if that desert sand can be transformed into the material that is going to be uh, used for 3D printing, you will do the first tick in the box. Once that tick in the box will move on, then yeah. we'll start moving to materiality that might change. Yeah. But we didn't, take the f we didn't go through the first tick in the box yet. Mm. And that's something important. And something about the metaverse that I forgot to mention. At the moment, the whole VR system that we have the headsets. The headsets, the way they are now, for me, I, don't, I can't use it because I feel dizzy. This technology is going to change. 
from a headset to glasses to be in a chip within the eye it's going to be lens absolutely and then yeah. you put the lens yeah and then you're in the metaverse directly yeah and the interaction will happen totally different differently yeah and the moment you start reaching that point and you start feeling smelling it's like the games that where we sit and they put air on us and then a little bit of water Absolutely. while you're crossing something. So the moment you start feeling and then smelling and all these things, that this will be, that's where the metaverse then will reach. But the big question is, the metaverse will be a success story, but what about the social life? Will there be any left? That's the whole, that's the whole question that's going to be defined by the future generations. Maybe not our kids, huh? Maybe not our kids. And that's why I said that who are the architects of the metaverse? Because really the logical extension of what you're saying, Jess, is very interesting, is that people obviously are driving currently trends within urbanism, driving trends within the building of communities and that we've said, and Professor Conaro referred to this, that currently we see a trend towards you know micro hubs whereby it's everything is on a more personal level you know the things you want to do your office your gym your recreational leisure services they're near to where you live they're not like a two-hour drive away anymore they're not like a two-hour commute away and yet and that reflects what people want but if people want to reside in a lot of their time within the universe within the metaverse, then, then all of that is just going to come to an end. All of that reality is going to be stifled because they're being the metaverse. I hope and pray that's not, that's not the plan. It's a big word. Yeah. But we are, believe, clever enough to understand what we want and to decide how we would like to move ahead. I don't want to be pushed to do something I'm not convinced about just because I'm going to make some more money or I have to jump in. So uh, we have, we as a human being, we have the choice to wake up in the morning and then have a coffee, then you can uh, uh, ride your car and then you decide which road to take and then you have this freedom I don't want to lose that freedom myself yeah. and to be pushed in something uh, I don't know where it's going to be leading. So w w our, our, our mission at the moment is to give our kids and the future generation, try to get them understand more about social, how important social life, how important the environment is, yeah. how important it is to protect each other, how there's a lot of importance and ethics and values. Yeah. Because we haven't seen much in the last century in architectural terms. We haven't seen many quantum leaps in terms of the concept of living, have we? Like there have been quantum leaps in materials we build with, you know, obviously the huge transition to steel frame in the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties, a mega transition. But, you know, when architects like Norman Foster, for instance, have tried to introduce new living concepts, it hasn't really worked. You know, that people haven't been prepared to take that complete step to a, you know, to living their whole lives within Millennium Tower, which is what Foster proposed, for instance, off the coast of Japan. Um, those huge transitions have never happened. Do you think people therefore will hold back from that big transition into the metaverse in the same way? How many people you have here? Three hundred? How many of them they don't like the open kitchen model? Shall we ask them? You don't need. They will let us down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying that that closed kitchen and open kitchen, which is it's, it's a concept that's been there forever. Absolutely. Still, till today, you have clients, they say, I don't want an open kitchen. So at the end of the day, is what do you feel and you need? It's up to you. Yes. So we as architects, designers, we do impose. That's why I call it architect dictators. But 
we dictate on people how they need to live yeah. in a way. So how much people are open for change? How much now there is some product in the market on residential where you have a two-bedroom apartment, it, does, it can, you just open a big, uh, a big wall and then it will become a big living. So they reduce the two-bedroom apartment size to make more money. But they told you that we can open this wall and then if you have people, it can get bigger. And you don't have toilets much because you share the guest toilet with your toilet. So where is the privacy of it? And you need to see the reaction. Yeah. But if you lived in Paris, you will find that a two-bedroom apartment, maybe it's 42 square meters or 45 square meters. Yeah. Where here, the two-bedroom apartment is 90 and 100. And Absolutely. 10 years ago, it was 160 square meter. I used yeah. to have an apartment in a green community. It was 180 square meter two-bedroom. It was like a football pitch Absolutely. for a two-bedroom apartment. Yeah. So things, I, that's why I keep saying that our times are like, we don't know where we are yet. We predict that we know, but we're still exploring. We are just exploring. Where would you like to be yourself in that exploratory process? Where do you want to position JT and partners in that process? Look, for us, it's like, we, we, we're trying to choose the projects where we can add value. You will never be able to change the whole process. But we are in a position, lucky position, that we say no to clients that we feel we're not going to add value to them and they add value to us. Because we would like to make a 1% change uh, impact on public run level, urban level, on the project, how it is developed taking into consideration a little bit the surrounding within the limit that we can convince the client. Yeah. So we're not going to stop because this is where we're keep, we're, we're, we are pushing. And that's why uh, we, we, we didn't stick to Dubai and UAE. We have project in Seychelles. We have project in Sri Lanka. Yeah. We have in Morocco in the mountains. So because each place has its own... Uh, spirit that's going to affect your architecture. You really need to get inspired from the surrounding. You cannot just only say that I have a piece of land and I'm going to build whatever I want to build. Before you build, you really need to understand the surrounding, the impact you're going to be doing on the surrounding. And that's why it's very important. And it's very important for the students to know that it's not about the architect ego. It is about the end user experience and the end user experience with your project it's not only the people living in your project it's how this project is interacting at the public realm at the, at, at the urban level that's going to make an implication on the social environment it's a very interesting point so i'd like to uh, open the conversation to yourselves ladies and gentlemen would any of you have any questions or queries for joe about about you know what he said very provocatively about the metaverse and the future. Do you have any queries or questions at all for Joe? The mic is behind you. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Interesting talk about the metaverse and uh, all the future of architecture, but seeing now what China, Paris, and Italy are doing. Where do you, as Joe, or where do you think us, our generation wants to live? In a greener environment or in the metaverse? And where do you think your kids and my kids wants to be? And where do you want them to be? What's better for them? For their mental health, for their, uh, uh, for, for their overall well-being? Thank you, Carol. Um... It's a, it's a difficult one because at the moment I'm not able to convince my daughter and my son <laughs> to do something or whatever. I'm not able to convince them. So that's why I said we need to prepare them. We need to show them everything, let them choose. For me, I want them to be living healthy and then being active and in a green area and then whatever, whatever. But it's going to be... Um, it's going to be uh, for them to choose because 
the way they're open for social media and the technology, it's gonna it's gonna sculpt them. It's gonna build them. That's 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 the only problem for me. I'm I'm getting old, but uh, I would like to be between the trees. You know what I mean, with a cow next to me and stuff like that. But uh, because we come from a different generation, we live different things. We didn't live there. You know, what what they are living at the moment. True. So that's that's it's 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 all about your reaction and what you want. That's 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 the whole key. You can wish for them, but they're gonna take the decision at the end. I'm sorry, I didn't give you the answer to be in the mountains next to the trees. <laughs> you can push them to go there. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm sure you must have many. Any questions for Joe at all, please? Joe, you've obviously very comprehensively tackled this topic. Any? Would you like to leave with a prediction? I know it's very, this is a very difficult topic to predict on. Do you think, maybe not next year, but in two years' time, a conference like this, a physical conference, will be replaced by a conference in our mind in the metaverse? What do you think? It's happening. It's happening already. It's happening. It is. It's already happening. It is. The Justin Bieber concert, it's like uh, you see on Fortnite there was a concert that happened on Roblox, there was a on uh, what they call it Minecraft. There was a concert that happened, attended by by all our kids. So uh, you you you're gonna uh, Meta, the Facebook board. They did uh, a meeting on the metaverse. Yeah. The wedding happened on the metaverse. So uh, uh, it will happen, and at the end of the day, it depends on people's reaction. Joe, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm sure Thank that you. well, you and I, we could continue all morning. I have no doubt about that. No, we'll, it's been, we'll, you know, we'll let it go. It's been so, so positive talking to you. Very intriguing Thank you, indeed. Thank you. Please, huge Thank round you. of applause for Joe Tabet. Thank you, Thank you very much.